Good evening to one and all present here. We welcome you all to today's webinar, The Future of Construction is Connected, giving the right people the right data at the right time to make the right decisions. This webinar is organized by Civil Engineering and Construction Review, sponsored by Trimble Solutions India, and powered by Revered Media. Before we get started with the webinar, we would like to present to you all a short introduction of Trimble Solutions India, followed by Civil Engineering and Construction Review. What does it take to navigate change, to recognize industry barriers and push through them? Unifying teams and technologies across the entire construction life cycle. What does it take to have every stakeholder on the same page, whether or not they're ever in the same place, with the right data at the right time to drive the right decisions? It takes the power to deliver, to boost productivity, improve quality, to champion sustainability, connecting the people, the processes, and the data through every phase of a project. It takes absolute confidence from Trimble Connected Construction to embrace change and drive digital transformation, to root out inefficiencies and exploit opportunities accelerating the pace of your success, no matter what the future holds. Trimble Connected Construction. Deliver with confidence. Civil Engineering and Construction Review. A leading infrastructure monthly on methods, materials, and machinery. Celebrating 34 years of publication, CE and CR is India's number one infrastructure monthly news journal for the past 34 years. We have been providing discerning knowledge and an unmatched coverage of the construction sector since 1988. Get social with the largest online construction media network of India. Civil Engineering and Construction Review provides a valuable, informative, unmatched high quality content. It is the most circulated magazine in India having a readership over 17 countries worldwide. Google rank number one under the search of Civil Engineering Magazine India and Construction Magazine India. We have a five-star rating as well. Currently stands at 58,000 plus followers on Facebook. 16,500 plus industry professionals connected on LinkedIn. You can also find us on other social media platforms such as Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and SoundCloud. No one around us in India. CENCR has been awarded the prestigious Best News Magazine by CIDC in the year 2014 and 2019. Best Publication Award by the ACCEI in 1991. Designated for International Quality Summit Award in Gold Category in Paris by BID in the year 2012. We cover topics such as roads and pavements, bridges, construction equipment, concreting, precast, high-rise structures, waterproofing, and many more. CE and CR is read by construction companies, contractors, builders, government departments, public sector undertakings, building material and equipment manufacturers, consultant and architectural engineers, research institutes, polytechnics and colleges. Connect with the most circulated and trusted magazine in India. Introducing to you all our moderator for the day, engineer Saurabh Manjrekar, who is the director of technology, Sunanda Global. He has worked at Sunanda for 10 years. 
Here, his specific focus is on developing sustainable solutions for large industrial and infrastructure project projects, besides overseeing the company's global operations from Dubai office. He is an expert on corrosion mitigation in steel and concrete structures and is regularly featured as keynote speaker by Apex industrial bodies, such as Confederation of Indian Industry. He has delivered over 60 lectures in more than 20 countries as part of his technical knowledge dissemination efforts. Most notably, he has invited to be a part of American Concrete Institute, ANSI and ISO, joint initiative of ISO TC 71 for making a uni unified umbrella global code for concrete. He has received various awards such as Innovator of the Year Construction Chemicals in the years 2012, 13 and 15, awarded by Department of Chemicals and Petrochemicals, Government of India and FICCI. American Concrete Institute's Young Member Award for Professional Achievement 2020. He currently serves on various ACI committees as well. Injane Saurabh currently serves as Honorary Secretary and Treasurer of India Chapter of American Concrete Institute. Welcome Injane Saurabh, over to you now. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's nice uh, to have such, uh, I mean, the experts in the field, right from uh, engineer V. N. Hegde, our panelists, Sri Dr. Uh, Shishir Bansalji, Mr. Harsh Parikji, and architect uh, Rohit Nagyaji. Also, it's wonderful that C and C R is taking this initiative time and again, not only to talk about topics that are relevant today, but topics that will continue or be relevant tomorrow or in the future as well. Um, but this topic is quite interesting to the, I mean, to me also as a the next or the young generation as to what is going to happen in the future uh, with respect to connected construction. Um, there has been a lot of discussion on this topic uh, in every industry. So it started with ISO, where there were management review meetings to connect various departments of one organization and bring them on the same page. Then the manufacturing industry uh, went with ERP to bring technology to connect various departments to improve uh, analytics, decision-making, cut costs. Uh, construction sites have, in fact, uh, for a long time also had ERPs, of course, but I mean, uh, something very basic that they've been doing is that, for example, say construction of a bridge, uh, installation of CCTV cameras at various locations on the bridge so that the project director can sort of monitor progress right there in his uh, office. So, so many such things have been done in the past and that's why this becomes very, very interesting on how to integrate all these things together today. Uh, and yeah, with that, I would like to move ahead to, and I request the organizers to please uh, project the slides. We're very fortunate today to have none other than the best uh, engineer VN Hegde to talk to us about this uh, very, very interesting topic. So uh, engineer Hegde has uh, seen a wide array of projects throughout his career. He has been former CEO of Stoop Consultants, former executive director of Gammon India, and a very, very senior professional with a rich experience of over three and a half decades in the construction industry. He is a re recipient of around 13 national recognitions in addition to an international prize from various institutions uh, such as IRC, ICI, NDRF, IBC, IABSE, Zurich. He has more than 160 publications to his credit and is a member of various IRC and BIS committees. He is also a member of TG 10.1 of FIB, which is a special task group working on FIB model code 2020. Apart from being on the technical board of ICI and the academic board of Sardar Patel College of Engineering, he is very importantly a fellow of the Indian National Academy of Engineering. He has been a strong proponent of sustainability and aesthetics in construction 
and has numerous publications on these two critical topics uh, since more than about 22 23 years now so welcome engineer hegre and we look forward to hearing uh, from you today thank you thank you thank you very much along with uh, engineer hegre we have a very eminent panel here today as well uh, dr shishir bansal who is chief engineer and executive director cpwd uh, he is currently uh, spearheading the aims avantipura project at jnk srinagar dr bansal uh, is has a bachelor's in civil engineering a masters in highway engineering and a phd in environmental engineering he started his career as a faculty member of punjab engineering college and thereafter he joined cpwd during his career spanning over 31 years in cpwd he has worked in various capacities and then risen to the level of chief engineer he is responsible he's been responsible for design and construction of numerous buildings as well as infrastructure projects like clover leaves flyovers underpasses elevated corridors and river over bridges he is very well known for the successful completion of the signature bridge an iconic structure over the river yamuna in new delhi in the capacity of chief project manager and presently he is posted by government of india and the union territory of jnk for the construction of the very prestigious 750 bedded aims at avantipura he has written more than 30 technical papers and presentations in various conferences in india and abroad he is the co convener of the g2 committee of irc member of irc bmtpc a director of india chapter of american concrete institute <coughs> member of icai indian institution of bridge engineers institution of engineers in indian institution of structural engineers indian buildings congress indian council of arbitration and american concrete institute usa thank you dr bansal we are very happy and fortunate that you could join us today as uh, the panel next we have mr harsh parekh regional sales director for trimble solutions india a senior leader with over 22 years of experience in developing and leading multi cultural teams in pan india roles he has an extensive working experience uh, across value chain with a track record of building strategy driving organizational transformation and business turnaround his key skills include cloud transformation construction technologies and fostering greater agility in the digital era proven expertise in strategy operations and sales with some of the largest b2b and b2c clients in india he speaks extensively on topics related to the future of construction technology and the transformative power of digital construction welcome mr harsh parekh glad to have you with us today we are also very happy to have architect rohit nagia with us director and ceo of <coughs> mda private limited architect nagia is a practicing architect for over two decades now a graduate of the prestigious school of architecture cpt ahmedabad he had been taught by the likes of bv doshi anant rajay kurula varki his undergrad thesis was a study of low cost architecture and vernacular design practiced by lori baker he has more than 413 built forms to his credit he holds a holonomic induction of experience in his work a green architect by qualification an avid researcher in low cost architecture has him widely known in the field of architecture and interior design a qualified griha trainer and evaluator he makes sure that build forms are sustainable energy efficient and low maintenance he has been invited as a guest speaker at numerous forums conferences architectural offices recently he was uh, invited to one of india's finest design firms of nimish patel and parul zaveri abikram ahmedabad <coughs> to share the process of some of his selected projects 
also invited as a guest speaker on sustainability in india's one of india's growing entrepreneurship platforms e growth and the recent pandemic lecture at jd institute of technology mda private limited his company recently won awards for the msme best retail of the year and msme best corporate of the year welcome architect nagya very happy to have you with us here today thank you so much sarup yes and um, with that i would like to once again welcome engineer vn hegde and request um, you to kindly start your presentation thank you thank you thank you very much uh, sarup for that uh, very nice uh, and uh, introduction in fact uh, i really liked your style of uh, introducing the people it was uh, that speaks a lot about your presentation skills i should say at your young age you know like that uh, that, that you have a lot of experience in presenting i can see that and also i am very happy to see uh, some of the stalwarts uh, among the panelists of course including yourself i should say that i know uh, our, uh, our friend uh, uh, our friend uh, uh, shishir uh, bansal uh, for a long time and uh, he has been on my sort of we were working as a partners in signature bridge in realizing that shishir bansal's contribution in that is uh, invaluable i should say it's 70% of the work of that bridge uh, was completed during his tenure though his tenure was much shorter compared to that of the uh, bridge bridge uh, construction tenure itself i should say that uh, and uh, also i am very happy to see Uh, from uh, uh, tremble uh, technology solutions as well as uh, architect uh, uh, though i i heard about uh, him i i can see that his achievement uh, is, uh, is 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 exemplary i should say that with this uh, short presentation for uh, short uh, remarks about the panelists i would just like to come back to my presentation today just uh, before starting this uh, my topic of the decarbonization of the built environment how it is connected i would like to talk about this connected construction uh, uh, which has been uh, spoken by the tremble uh, uh, solutions uh, as you can see here the the theme has been already explained by the tremble but uh, i thought i would like to i i would encapsulate the whole connected construction in one uh, capsule as has been presented to you people on the screen over here all of us in the know that in the built environment we have the stakeholders like client owner architects designers engineers contractors suppliers subcontractors etc while uh, realizing the projects or a construction uh, project uh, there is a lot of uh, gaps or the disconnection between the people's uh, processes as well as the technologies leading to the wastes normally in the lean construction we talk about uh, seven ways but uh, i have presented here the six ways which i feel is very very important ways in the construction field that's a waiting waiting when i say just to give an example waiting for the designs waiting for the decisions from the various sectors waiting for the materials supply to the site etc so all this wastes uh, will uh, 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 result in because of the disconnections as well as the gaps these disconnections as well as the gaps can be bridged by the digital uh, technology interventions as uh, as has been told by saurabh in his uh, uh, introductory uh, uh, remarks the intervention by the applications applications with the software digital interventions like beam nowadays we talk about the internet of things which will make this ecosystem of the built environment among the stakeholders open it 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 allows the shared data and also the real time updation of the information you know that will culminate in what we talk about the enhanced margins as well as the market share the manpower shortage issue will be sorted out and the high efficiency as well as the sustainability safety enhanced projects and the competitive edge, edge. so that is how uh the the construction is connected what we call it as a connected construction and this connected construction is possible 
by the technological intervention, the digital intervention, and also nowadays what people are talking about the internet of things. Now, coming back to my topic of the presentation today, that is uh, decarbonization of the built environment. I'm just going to explain this, uh, how, it is, uh, how it is connected to in many ways. As we have been speaking, you know, like uh, now all of us have realized that the climate change is not just a slogan and a, and, and, a, and, 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 and a myth. It's no more a myth and it, is, it has to be arrested. Pre-industrial era, whatever the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere has been doubled now to the 410 ppm. In fact, in the last decade, the concentration has increased uh, by to 2.5 plus or minus 0.26. That means around 2.76 ppm per year compared to the 1960-1970 of 1 ppm per year. What does this concentration of the carbon dioxide emission to the environment result in? That result in the global warming. It has been a, a very well established by this time. And the, in, the global warming in results in the, what we call it as a climate change. And the climate change has a manifestation as, as all of us have been experienced these days by super uh, cyclones, change precipitation patterns, floods, droughts, wildlife, landslides, melting of ice and glaciers, as well as avalanches. And India is also not the exception to this. We have been observing most of these things in India more frequently these days because of the climate change. Now, unless this uh, global warming is arrested, uh, as has been established by many of the scientists up to 1.5 degree by 2050 or 2070 degree centigrade, if it goes up to three degrees centigrade unarrested, there is a possibility of, I, 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 I what I call it as apocalypse, you know, like that. Earlier days, we used to talk about pralaya and those sort of things. And it, it, it doesn't seem to be impossible these days, it looks like. Now, let us have a look at this carbon dioxide emission uh, intensity uh, to the environment. The different studies uh, give the different figures and uh, I went through the many of the figures. The variation is quite a lot. As you can see, one of the studies uh, from Japan, it says 32,840 million tons of carbon dioxide emission has been taking place as of 2017. The other study gives around 49 uh, million, 4.9, uh, uh, 49.4 uh, uh, billion. That's around 49,000 uh, uh, million tons of carbon dioxide emission to the environment. As, it, as is the case in the variation of the carbon dioxide emission, depending upon the studies which has been conducted, the reality is that the, the China has been emitting around 28% and the United States is emitting about 15% while India is coming third. That is a, that is a matter of worry for us, you know, like 6.6%, almost around 2,162 million tons of carbon dioxide emission is uh, uh, emitted to the environment. Now, out of this, the construction sector or, or the built environment, what we call it as, uh, accounts for around 30%, you know, like that. Uh, out of the 30%, 17.5% uh, is the energy usage in the buildings. Energy usage in the building, in the sense, nowadays, whatever the energy which we have been uh, getting to be used is uh, coming from the fossilized uh, fuel sources. When we, use, when we get the energy from the fossilized fuel forces, normally we burn the coal. While burning the coal uh, by the thermal power plants or the energy producing uh, agencies, what, may, uh, uh, what normally happens is the carbon dioxide is emitted to the environment. That energy is being used in the building for the operation of uh, so many things, vertical uh, systems like lifts and kind of thing, or the energy itself. That amounts for 17.5%. Whereas in the built environment itself, for the construction uh, processes itself, uh, it, 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 it accounts for 12.75% to the environment, out of which the major contribution is from the cement and steel, that's around 3 and 2.75%. These are all on an average I have taken on the basis of the different studies, but uh, this has to be sort of confirmed by the actual research. In fact, 
and the, also the other building materials as well as the construction processes uh, account for 1.25 percent and the rest of the things like utility end of the life beyond the life accounts for 5.75 percent so we can say that uh, easily that the built environment uh, uh, accounts for around 30 percent of the carbon dioxide emission to the environment and it's a matter of concern for all of uh, we civil engineers and we'll have to see how do we control this uh, in the future there are two uh, major uh, events uh, took place in the world to arrest this uh, the climate change uh, uh, issues that is uh, all of you know that the paris agreement a very famous paris agreement that's also called as a cop 21 which took place in 2005 15 our indian response by our prime minister uh, uh, commitment to uh, to the world was that we reduce the emissions intensity uh, to 30 to 35 percent uh, by 2030 450 uh, gigawatt uh, renewable energy will be going for that means non-fossilized uh, uh, sources basically when you go for the non-fossilized sources the emission of the carbon dioxide to the environment is uh, nil and also 40 percent cumulative electric power installed capacity from non fossil fuel energy resources by 2030. This was the commitment. In recently concluded COP26 in Glasgow, uh, our uh, new commitment was given by our prime minister, what he called it as a panchamrata. And you know, panchamrata means, uh, for those who don't know the, uh, the Sanskrit, it is called the uh, panchamrata means the five panaceas, uh, basically for overcoming the uh, carbon dioxide emission of the climate change to the environment. And the revised commitments uh, by 2030 was made stringent compared to that of the Paris commitment, which was uh, uh, which was given earlier. Now, as you can see here on the screen, the reduced uh, economy's carbon intensity down by 45 percent, which is 30 to 35 percent, which was said in Paris, and the non-fossilized energy, that's a renewable energy sources, augmentation to the 500 gigawatt. Uh, capacity compared to that of 450, that 50 kilowatt was increased and 50% of the energy requirement through the renewable energy was promised in uh, Glasgow compared to that of 40% in, uh, in, 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 in uh, uh, Paris, as you can see. And also, uh, it was to be achieved in two stages. In the second stages, uh, of the, though the world has been targeting the carbon neutrality, that is a zero Net, net zero emission by 2050, uh, practically, I think that is not possible. That's what our uh, prime minister had felt. That is why he has committed to achieve this uh, carbon neutrality or the net zero emission by 2070. That is, a, that is our intention and that is the response of India to the needs of the carbon neutrality of the world. Since uh, 2015, that the COP21 summit in Paris, I think uh, the India's achievement is commendable compared to that of many other countries. And as committed, India already, you know, like 101.53 gigawatt renewable energy capacity represent 38% of the overall installed uh, uh, power capacity. 250% uh, is achieved in seven years. And it was not committed, but the more than committed was achieved. Target of 20% ethanol blending in metro, uh, petrol, by 2025 is feasible. Right, presently, to 8.5% uh, ethanol is uh, mixed with the petrol. When the ethanol is mixed with the petrol, by uh, 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 percentage goes up, naturally the carbon dioxide emission is uh, in increased. Now, this ethanol, it is possible for us to uh, get it from the CCUS. CCUS in the sense, it's a technology of carbon capturing, using and sequestrating in the sense, carbon which has been produced, say for example, from the thermal power plants, as well as uh, the steel plants and the cement plants can be captured from any plants for that matter and can be converted into the ethanol, the, what they call it as a sequestration. I think by this methodology, I think it's possible for us to increase this, uh, uh, you know, like uh, the ethanol production, converting the carbon dioxide emission into the ethanol and making sure that ethanol can be mixed with the petrol using that technology by 225 is intended to uh, mix 20% of the ethanol into the petrol. And it's also since 2015, metro rail services increased from five cities to 18 cities. 
and the 15 numbers of the airports had uh, solar power facilities. That is the solar power facilities, nothing but from the non-renewable renewable energy sources. That is from the non-fossilized energy sources, which doesn't uh, burn coal and emit the carbon dioxide into the environment. And also LED lighting system in the 80 airports have been installed. And the 11 sectors identified for the resource uh, recycling and among top 10 countries, India figured in as a climate change performance index. So from Paris to even Glasgow within the seven years, India's achievement in the, in the direction of the neutrality of the carbon, carbon neutrality or a zero uh, uh, carbon emission is commendable compared to that of many other countries as you can has been demonstrated. Now let me explain before coming to this uh, uh, real uh, uh, connectivity, connected uh, uh, decarbonization in the built environment from the Indian perspective, what is the concept of the decarbonization of the built uh, environment? Uh, first of all, we'll have to understand what is this uh, carbon dioxide equivalent in the environment. Generally, carbon dioxide equivalent is referred as just carbon for the convenience sake and whatever the greenhouse gases, it's not just carbon dioxide, but there are other gases also like CH4, NTO, etc. That's very minimum compared to that of the carbon dioxide. The major is the carbon dioxide. That is called the carbon emission or the carbon dioxide emission. And this carbon dioxide emission has uh, the global warming potential as I have explained to that, which will leading to the climate change, thereby manifestation of so many catastrophes, what, uh, what I had explained as. This growth, uh, warming, global warming potential is called, say, for example, one kg carbon dioxide emission, you know, equivalent. That is how it is, unit has been uh, given to this global warming potential, one kg carbon dioxide equivalent. And this carbon dioxide equivalent, it should be the operation carbon. We said that the carbon dioxide emission is for the uh, purpose of the convenience, it is called carbon and the operation carbon as well as the embodied carbon. What is operation carbon? The operation carbon is energy, which, 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 which the carbon dioxide which has been emitted to the environment from the energy centric operation in buildings such as heating, cooling, ventilation, and the lighting system. For all these purposes, the energy is required, whether it's for running lifts, uh, water pumps, common lighting, household appliances like fridges, washing machines, TV computers, cooking applications, etc. All this is used, uh, the energy used for the operation of this, this energy presently is from the fossilized uh, 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 fuels. Basically by burning the coal uh, and while burning the coal, the carbon dioxide emission takes place to the environment that has been used. And this energy is called the operation carbon. Normally this uh, operation carbon issue in the built environment. When I say in the built environment, for the operation of the buildings as well as the commercial complexes, whatever the operation carbon is required can be solved by providing the energy from the renewable sources. So from the non-renewable sources, that is uh, from the fossilized fuel sources, we'll have to go for non-fossilized fuel sources like wind energy, solar energy, hydroelectric energy, biomass energy, as well as the nuclear energy. Of course, this is not in the hands of the civil engineer, Rest, it, it is in the hands of the energy sector. Energy sector has been working tremendously in India. I have seen the debates among the energy sector uh, trying to, you know, say, for example, the nuclear power energy trying to push there, saying that energy has to be utilized more. And, uh, and the solar energy sector that is uh, uh, working, which has been saying that that is uh, better because it's quite economical and cheaper compared to the nuclear energy. The, already the fight is going on between among the various energy sectors. And this energy sectors is very confident by 2040 to 2050, they will be able to achieve the carbon neutrality as far as the energy sector is concerned. So the operation carbon issue has to be addressed by the energy sector. In fact, it's not to be addressed by us. In very, to a very small extent, the architects has to address this. In a sense, uh, the architects have to design the buildings in such a way that the buildings are green buildings. I think among us, we have got a good architect. I would like to hear from him, what will be their contribution in achieving 
in reducing this energy consumption, especially in the buildings, you know, operation of the building in, in, in achieving operational carbon efficiency. That I think uh, during the panel discussion, we can have that. The next is the embodied carbon. What is embodied carbon? The embodied carbon is the carbon emission associated with the five main stages of structures of the entire life. These include product state, you know, like this, uh, in, in, in construction industry, the major, say for example, the material is uh, cement and steel. Of course, there are other uh, materials, building materials are, are, are also there. And in, in producing this materials itself, I think there is a, from the industry, the cement uh, factories, as well as the steel factories, the carbon dioxide emission takes place. That is say, for example, one, tons of the, one ton of the cement production emits around 0.8 ton of carbon dioxide equivalent to the environment, whereas one ton of the steel emits around two ton carbon dioxide equivalent to the environment. So that is uh, the, the embodied energy, which is there in the cement as well as the steel itself. And when the, it is converted into a product or an artifact, and that is also con con contains this embodied energy. And also while constructing, for the transportation to the site, say for example, that the concrete which has been produced has to be transported, steel which has been fabricated has to be transported and installed. For that purposes, what has been, whatever has been sent is the construction stage. Similarly, there will be utility stage, end of the life stage, beyond the life cycle. Beyond the life cycle, the, what we are famously call it as nowadays the circularity, you know, which is a reuse, recovery, recycling potential. So all at five stages, the embodied carbon is, uh, gets manifested. Nearly 50% of this embodied carbons for the product, product state, building materials, except the production of the building material as the production of the material which has been used in the construction, in the construction product stage, as well as the construction stage together accounts for the 50% of this carbon dioxide, uh, this one. This called embodied carbon factor. When this embodied carbon factor is a kg equivalent, the carbon dioxide equivalent per kg of the material. That is called the embodied carbon factor. Different countries will be having different embodied carbon factors. In our country also, some work has been done as to what is the embodied carbon factors. And when that carbon factor is multiplied by the quantum of the materials which has been used in an artifact or in a construction, that is called the embodied energy which has gone into the, uh, the construction or the, or the artifact. That is how it is. This is the concept of, uh, 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 the concept of uh, 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 carbon, that is the operation carbon as well as the embodied carbon. Now, during the construction of any artifact or a project or a, any facility for that matter, it, it has uh, three stages, the production of the raw material itself, concrete production or the steel, or the steel fabrication and the erection, steel production, uh, installation product, installation, as well as the construction process. All at the th three, two di three different levels, we'll be having the embodied carbon, which has been generated. Not only the embodied carbon, which has been generated, even during the construction stage, sometimes the energy is required for running the construction plants and equipment. That energy is called the operation carbon. Basically that has to be separately you know, like that energy sources has to be replaced by renewable energy sources that we we'll have to look into. Generally, the technologies and the strategies to achieve this carbon neutrality by 2070, in our case in India, in the built environment are, normally it is the design efficiency, including the, the design efficiency itself. I'll, I'll explain to that how it can be done. Whole cycle impacts that we are taught that there is a circularity and other things construction process, including the production as well as the erection, instead of, in case of the steel structure, it may be a fabrication as well as the erection. These three are in the domain of basically in the civil engineers. And the other three strategies as well as the technologies, say for example, reduction during the material production. I think perhaps the, say for example, steel as well as the cement manufacturer has to see that the plant has been upgraded and they have to make sure that the carbon dioxide emission which has been taking place into the environment because of this production uh, is reduced. Right now, for the cement, I said 0.8 ton per equivalent of carbon dioxide is emitted, steel 0.5 ton equivalent. And production of the, uh, the, the, the 
uh, uh, one t- a ton of cement normally around 4.8 gigajoule energy is required that energy presently is used by the uh, the fossilized uh, uh, fuel uh, fossilized fuel or uh, non uh, renewable energy uh, non renewable energy sources that has to be changed another is the decarbonizing energy energy sector itself as i explained whatever the energy which has been supplied to these plants for the production of the material that energy itself could can come through the renew- renewable energy sources and that can be sorted out and carbon capture as well as the utilization whatever the carbon dioxide which has been emitted through the uh, during the production of the steel as well as the cement i'm taking the example of the steel and cement because it it produces the most maximum uh, carbon dioxide emission uh, to the environment and that carbon dioxide which has been emitted can be captured in the some form converted into some other chemicals and that chemical can be used in the industry uh, like ethanol uh, what i what i explained earlier then all carbon dioxide emission into the environment due to the production of the steel as well as the cement is reduced to a large extent on the basis of my study i have just uh, given here to achieve the carbon neutrality or a zero net uh, carbon emission to the environment by 2070 uh, roughly these figures are not uh, uh, sanctimonious in the sense it's not uh, uh, it may not be the correct figure it's on the basis of my judgment i have given over here in case of the design efficiency it's possible for us to save around 17.5% by 2070 if you do that uh, 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 proper efforts whole cycle impacts i think perhaps we can reduced by 15% if you take the reference as 2021 of course from 2015 to 2021 india as i told you has achieved the carbon neutrality by 20% already in my opinion and from 2021 to 2070 these are the some of the strategies for example that the reduction at product stage itself which is not in the hands of the civil engineers or those stakeholders who are into the built environment it is not there but it where there it is around 28% is possible decarbonizing energy and uh, uh, that is around 4% decarbonization of energy in the sense energy which has been produced to uh, the uh, plants for the production of the steel as well as the cement around 6.5% is possible to uh, reduce and of course ccus a uh, lot of uh, research is going on in the ccus i am aware of in the indian institutions and to a large extent they have been Uh, on the verge of getting to a lot of get throughs and by that it is possible for them to uh, achieve around 25% and lastly the construction process itself i think in the construction process also we require the energy presently the energy which has been used in the construction is from the uh, non renewable resources and that has to be converted into renewable resources even the construction process also it is possible for us to 8% so these are some of the figures which have been worked out by 2070 to achieve the carbon neutrality but uh, these are the figures which has been uh, given on the basis of my judgment it is not the it may not be the correct figure research has to be done to achieve uh, arrive at the correct figure now i'll come to that uh, issue of present uh, issue how our uh, you know like the, uh, the 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 carbonization of the built environment is connected among the various stakeholders as as all of us are aware in the indian uh, uh, built environment uh, uh, industry or a built environment ecosystem there are uh, several stakeholders the stakeholders i classify as owners owners engineers and the architects designers and contractors and uh, they who can do the value engineering design efficiency mishap free design and construction structural systems uh, which can be chosen by the designer which is uh, carbon uh, efficient friendly and also the major part in my opinion is the standards and the code makers role is very very important and many of the unsustainable construction which has been going on in our country is due to the standards and the codes i think that needs to be addressed i am going to address all this stakeholders contribution requirement for the decarbonization of the built environment in the succeeding uh, uh, this one the owners engineers and the architects as well as the Uh, owners themselves have to insist uh, uh, to this uh, or uh, in their contract documents of the rfps have to make sure this the use of this uh, uh, criteria this use of this items has been encouraged to a large extent say for example 
mandatory use of the recycled uh, materials, mandatory use of the manufactured aggregates, including slag as well as the ash aggregate. It has to be encouraged. Sometimes I see that, especially among the owners, engineers side, owner themselves may be interested in encouraging all the sort of things. There's a, some sort of a resistance from the owners, engineers, or authority engineers, or the PMC engineers. That has to be that because quoting that the coder classes, the code doesn't permit. That's why we cannot. I think we'll have to overcome that uh, uh, inertia of uh, protecting ourselves by giving the coder uh, uh, protection uh, guard, protective guards. And also recycling glass residue at, at, as light aggregate to the roads, road bases, replacement of OPC with the mineral light mixture. And it has been very much established that these days you can use the mineral light mixtures like the fly ash as well as the GGBFS maximum to the maximum extent. It's not necessary to be restricted to 35% only or the 70% only in case of the slag. And also the encouraging HPC, HSC, high grade steel to the extent possible, which will reduce the quantum of the material, the mass of the mass of the uh, structure itself. And the self-compacting concrete is a very sustainable concrete and which can be used. It has to be encouraged. And the design build contract uh, where the contractor can do the value engineer and uh, make sure that his, uh, his, his, uh, his, his, uh, his uh, structures are becoming not only cost effective, but also the carbon effective, what I call it as this days and specifying the limits of the carbon dioxide emissions and the energy consumption in the contract. Uh, and uh, nowadays, anyway, the contracts have been issued on the QCBC, 80%, 20%, 70%, 30%, 30% we are going for. And perhaps it's a time that we gave a lot of uh, rating for this carbon dioxide efficient structures, you know, carbon efficient uh, structures in the sense which, which produces the less, I think the high rating can be given. That is where the owners as well as the uh, owners, engineers, and the architects can play a very, very important role. The role of the designers and contractors is also very, very important. And uh, by doing a proper value engineering uh, during the design stage itself, you see, the most of the, uh, the, 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 the structure's cost, as well as the, uh, the carbon dioxide, uh, embodied carbon dioxide is created uh, during the design stage itself. And the structure has the embodied carbon dioxide, the embodied carbon. And this embodied carbon is created during the design stage. By doing a proper value engineering, I think it's possible to reduce this uh, carbon dioxide, uh, the em uh, environment to the uh, uh, emission to the environment to the large uh, extent, in my uh, opinion. And by doing the value engineer during the design stage, even if one is able to reduce around 20%. Uh, uh, carbon dioxide emission to the environment, I think that's good enough because 70% of the uh, structure's carbon dioxide emission is created during the design stage. I think that is where a lot of value engineering has to be done from the carbon dioxide emission point of view, carbon efficiency point of view, not from the cost point of view. If you do from the carbon efficiency point of view, automatically your cost is also taken care of as uh, it normally happens the connected uh, construction uh, in, in, in the connected construction. And also uh, it is possible to do the value engineer if it's a build, design build uh, contract, because uh, uh, it's say, for example, that uh, the design build contractor may be having the necessary, the plants and the equipments as well as the enabling structure, which he may, can make use of the same, which has been already there. He doesn't have to, to fabricate and re reinvent it again for the next, uh, uh, next uh, projects thereby the structures which is going to produce becomes a carbon efficiency efficient. So that there's a need for us to go for the design build, encourage the design build contracts from the point of view of decarbonization of the built environment. Another, other, uh, some of the areas where design efficiency can be addressed is the uh, use of very high strength uh, steel and concrete to reduce the mass of the structure itself. And uh, the types of the steel like the stainless steel weathering steel as well as the high strength steel can be explored. Detailing category of the fatigue, you know, like the welded connections require the largest section from the detailing category of the fatigue. The welded section can be, uh, especially for those structures, the fatigue oriented uh, designs, fatigue is governing, perhaps it may be uh, ideal to go for the bolted connections in the, instead of the welded connection. Standardization in the precast 
as well as the prefabrication, pre-stressing in steel structures to reduce the quantum of the steel. These are some of the areas where the design efficiency can be increased to from the point of view of the decarbonization. Use of composite construction with a very high ultra performance concrete and use of ultra high performance concrete in combination with the pre-stressing design for future predation, widening and reuse so that after the 100 years of service life, the structure is not necessary to be dismantled and you can design a structure so that it can be uh, keeping in mind that it can be upgraded even after the 100 years, optimizing the connection details, detailing for better sustenance, improving corrosion protection, all these sort of issues can be addressed during the design stage, in fact. Uh, Mr. Uh, Hegde, sir, just a minute, I, I just wanted to uh, update yeah. you that we are almost at half time now. Yeah. Uh, so whenever it's okay with you, uh, we would like to also ask you a lot of questions on, as a panel member also. So you please, uh, you may decide accordingly. Thank okay. you. Okay, I will be able to complete uh, before that. I think uh, that that not be an issue. Another half time is there, no? Another 15 minutes is there, right? It's almost, it's 4.25, so at 4.30 is half time. 4.20, 4.30 is the half time in the sense I should complete by 4.30? As, I mean, as you deem fit, but uh, I mean, we were, we had planned for first half for the presentation and second half for panel. Fine, fine, fine. I'll be, I'll be finishing fast. Thank you. And Thank also, you. I think it's very, very important to uh, design the structures in, in, and construct the structures in such a way, especially the design the structures in such a way that uh, the structures are mishaps free during the construction. And uh, many of the construction uh, during the construction which has been happening these days, the mishaps have been taking place. Any mishap which has been uh, happening, uh, you know, it's unsustainable in the sense those structures, there will be a cost overrun, there will be a time overrun, and during this time overrun, and also the replacement of the structure has to take place and it, it invariably results in the unsustainable, uh, 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 the carbonizing uh, environment. The replacement again requires the structures to be rebuilt and again, the further emission of the carbon dioxide emission to the environment. That needs to be addressed. So it has to be. Unfortunately, many times it is experienced a known task such as design and construction. Ironically, this occurs frequently. Already happened incidents com com continue to happen. We don't uh, learn the lesson. There are some instances uh, uh, which are unforeseeable. It is not totally unforeseeable, but we can say that the one which you can see on the right hand bottom corner of the slide that you know it's a tub girder uh, which has been designed and was being executed the steel tub girder with the having a radius of 300 uh, meter there is no code in india for designing of that and uh, uh, that was being attempted and it fell down so it is sometimes it's not unforeseeable totally unforeseeable but uh, i think these are the sort of the things which has to be this one and also the choice of foundations is very very important you'll have to see that the pile foundation is done uh, where it is not possible for us to have an open foundation in the in the open rock bed and in, in the rivers and also having uh, the foundations like well foundation the cities uh, where a uh, lot of traffic is on either side and this sort of sort of things you know the choice of foundations is very very artesian conditions uh, whenever it is there it has to be established properly that the artesian condition how to do the foundations and uh, if uh, for any reasons uh, the wells get sunk and again it has to be done. Again, it's all uh, leads to the unsustainable conditions. In a hilly region, make sure that uh, there is no possibility of the boulders rolling down from the top, uh, hampering or the, you know, destroying the bridges. These are the, some of the things which has to be taken care of by the designers during the design. And also, uh, uh, this is one of the cases in Anjika Bridge where halfway through the project, uh, which has been done halfway through has to be abandoned because uh, the geological uh, surprise uh, was encountered and whatever the work which has been done and the carbon dioxide emission which has been has already taken place has to be repeated once again this this these are the things which needs to be uh, addressed and the change in the sequence of construction during the construction and the change during the construction all leads to the uh, the unsustainable construction practices trying and we always have a fancy for you know like this going for this a uh, very small slim as well as the longer structure whenever we are going for that we'll have to make sure that the secondary efforts which are not governing so far uh, is not uh, governing in this particular case and the designer has to be careful there are instances where this sort of failures have taken place and the recklessness in in a, 
structural safety and verification during the design stage. It may not be necessarily, it's not properly done. The design is not done. All these things leads to this uh, mishaps as well as the collapse, which will put uh, us back uh, to a large extent uh, uh, from the sustainability point of view, and also from the decarbonization point of view, I think we'll have to address. Another issue is the structural system itself has to be addressed by the designer during the construction. Say, for example, if you're going for an arch, uh, a structural form, it is very, very durable, endurable. And uh, I think the carbon efficient uh, structure because there's no, not much steel is involved here. Most of the structures are subjected to the compression, actual compression rather than the flexure and the crackability, cr the ability to crack is less because it's always under the compression. And also it doesn't require uh, much uh, you know, expansion joints as well as the bearings and it is not necessary. So such structural uh, configuration, structural uh, form should be adopted. And also the art, which is a composite uh, art, which is filled up with the concrete in the hollow section that will optimize the design that will reduce the quantum of the steel as well as the uh, concrete in the structure. I think these are some of the uh, strategies as well as the technologies which can be adopted from the decarbonization point of view. And using UHPC as well as the pre stressing, you know, like uh, that will reduce the floor height to height. And the floor height to height, when it is reduced, your glass facade uh, area is reduced. And also your uh, uh, flexibility in the layout, uh, minimum columns is there. And the steel and concrete will be reduced to a large extent to 20 to 30 percent. And your vertical operating system, energy requirement system will be reduced because the height of the structure for a given facility is reduced because of the ultra high performance concrete as well as the pre-stressing beams. The, the smaller beams can, you know, the, 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 the depth is not required, larger depth is not required. All these advantages are there that will add to it. The similarly, in case of the bridges, also the pre-stressing gives a lot of uh, uh, sustainable uh, uh, advantages uh, like lesser joints, bearings, thereby minimum maintenance, improved serviceability and durability, less deflection, cracking, because of that we achieve that serviceability and durability, and the less cycle time during construction and the minimum disruption to the traffic. Otherwise, the traffic has to be uh, diverted. When the traffic is diverted, your operation cost of the transportation, because the detour, the, the, the traffic uh, has to take place will result in. So the improved lighting visibility, there are so many sustainable options. Another issue is, I think, perhaps in our Indian case, there's a need to look into the a review of the safety factors itself. And, you know, like there's uh, always we have a, a set of uh, a mindset that while formulating the codes that uh, that uh, that uh, we feel that, you know, that our construction practices in India is not uh, uh, very advanced. All these uh, construction deficiencies has to be taken care of by the partial safety factors. We have a tendency to inbuild a very, very high uh, safety factor, fa factor of safety. I think that needs to be looked into from the decarbonization of the built environment uh, uh, point of view. And the contrary, if you really look at it, uh, some of the structures which has been built, whether it's the uh, Akkar Bridge at Cable Stay Bridge or uh, Siddhapur Bridge at Kurg, these are the bridges which has been uh, uh, constructed when the codes, uh, codal references, codal guidelines were not there. In my opinion, building as well as the technological um, technology aspects has been advanced more earlier than the code makers, code making as well as the standard making in some cases in India, that apprehension should be uh, 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 rest uh, aside. And uh, I think we'll have to review the safety factors and make it more uh, embodied carbon friendly in the sense uh, that the, the mass of the structure should be reduced because of the uh, review, reviewing of the safety factors. There are also the, I think issues, this uh, I have been showing in many cases, you know, that, that the usage of uh, uh, you know like uh, you know, wrong uh, uh, formulas for the calculation of the score depth, uh, there will be a national uh, uh, scoring takes place because it receives. There are some cases in Tapi Bridge as far as the Pasigat with the founding, uh, which has been tried to sink the well foundation uh, up to the founding level, could not be sunk, but later it has to be terminated at 20 meter higher, and uh, during that period, uh, pneumatic sinking was adopted blasting was adopted and so much uh, uh, the carbon dioxide emission uh, takes place and all this could be uh, addressed by addressing the codal provisions uh, in Indian uh, uh, situation. Similarly, 
there are cases where where uh, where it, because of the codal class in the irc foundation code it says that uh, the depth of the foundation in the nearby bridge which is being going to be built as a new has to be same as that of the bridge in the vicinity and uh, using this though theoretically it is possible for us to uh, take the founding level higher by uh, say uh, higher uh, theoretically design wise using this class without understanding the spirit of the class by being insisted upon there are cases where 24 well foundations had to be taken down additionally by 10 meter and that means 240 meter additional sinking which is not required leading into the 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 carbon dioxide additional uh, environment emission to the environment additional energy which has to be spent is around 70000 giga uh, giga joule whereas the that can in fact sustain 3257 families per annum that uh, that waste which has takes place and the carbon dioxide additional to the environment because of this sort of decision is 5530 uh, ton in this case so this needs to be addressed by the code makers by putting this sort of uh, small small things it becomes also there are indian codes uh, where it is very progressive from the sustainability point of view for example this is uh, 383 which is meant for the aggregates they are encouraging the slag as well as the ash aggregates which is coming out of the steel iron as well as the copper industry basically but i think there's a need to increase the percent of this uh, aggregates this ash as well as the manufacture what they call it as a manufactured aggregates uh, using of this manufactured aggregate more even for example this recycled aggregate i think only the 25 percent is presented they allowed in the in the in the pcc in, in the rcc and, and in psa it is not allowed i think we should start using it and also there should not be limit for uh, adding this ply ash as well as G gbfs and other uh, uh, mineral admixtures in the concrete uh, mixed design as far as we are able to justify through the mixed design by replacement of the opc by higher margin with the mineral admixture it's possible to achieve this carbon neutrality by 2070 i think in this direction we will have to work another case is uh, rampantly taking place because segmental collapses these days where the epoxy glues has been applied and it has been reported by some investigating officers uh, i think some of the investigating officers are there in the audience also too i think dr harsha is also there i can see that and because of the improper application of the epoxy on this uh, segments uh, that that becomes a, some sort of a shame there is no improper application when it hardens there is no uniform application of the compressive forces there is a concentration of the compressive forces leading to the crushing of the concrete thereby uh, triggering the mishaps this has been reported and why don't we go for the external pre testing without uh, the epoxy application itself this epoxy application is an unsustainable uh, uh, provision and it 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 it, 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 it takes uh, one year more for the construction uh, for a 10 kilometer elevated uh, uh, wire deck and also it takes uh, almost 5 crore rupees additional expenditure and the epoxy glue itself is an unsustainable material so i think there is a need uh, in our among our code makers also to look into uh, this and uh, as the time is short that i will come to the conclusion so the conclusions are uh, very important so not to miss out any words in the conclusion i will write uh, to read it out uh, our button here connected construction by technology that is the digital intervention basically will not only address the cost and time overrun issues but also is a boon for sustainable construction that will have to understand decarbonization to carbon neutrality by 2070 when i say carbon neutrality net zero emission by 2070 in built environment demands connected approach by all the stakeholders whether they are owners architects designers contractors and code makers carbonization and climate change is no more a myth and and the slogan it's an issue of ethical and moral responsibility of all of all of us stakeholders owing to our uh, posterity in my view and it's very appropriate to end this presentation in my opinion with this uh, bhagavad bhagavad gita shloka yada yada hi dharmasya lanir bhavati bharata abhyutyanam adharmasya tadatmanam sujan niham what does it mean whenever a righteousness dharma means righteousness i think it's not mistaken for a religion here 
whenever a righteousness is on decline, the unrighteousness is on ascendance, then I present myself. Paritranaya sadhuna vinashaya cha dhrushkrutham dharma sanstapanathaya sambhavami yuge yuge. To protect virtuous, to extinguish evil, for establishing righteousness on firm footing, I reincarnate, reincarnate eight to eight. I think for us, perhaps, for owing to our posterity, I think the time has come for us to rise ourselves and uh, we become I here. All of us become I here to safeguard the righteousness of arresting the climate change, uh, in my opinion. Time has come for that. With this, uh, I stop my presentation and uh, let us have a very world, uh, for a safe world uh, uh, for our posterity by arresting the climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Engineer Hegre. That was uh, a very comprehensive presentation. Lots of important, pertinent topics are covered and also practical ways to tackle those issues. So I mean, theory along with a lot of practical examples. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so with this, uh, I uh, invite the panel, uh, the eminent panel, Dr. Shishir Bansal, uh, Mr. Harish Parik, architect Rohit Nagya, and of course, engineer um, Vian Hegde. So, uh, Engineer Hegre, I would like to start with you. Yeah. Um, I mean, as you are aware, for decades, the construction industry has struggled with tight margins, poor productivity, labor shortages. But let's leave that aside for now. What is a newer concern that is coming up for the past couple of years is health and safety, typically uh, COVID-19. So in terms of COVID-19, um, the COVID-19 situation or how does it affect the construction industry? Uh, can I have your inputs on how does con connected construction affect that or help us with uh, the COVID-19 situation for the construction industry? See, as you rightly said that uh, the emerging uh, the situation, what I call it is an emerging new market, you know, like the market for the construction industry is different because of the pandemic has changed the whole uh, approach towards our construction, not only the construction, for, for example, everything now. Especially in view of this, uh, when we talk about uh, uh, that part of the construction, that is where uh, the designing is there, design delivery has to be there. I think there the connected construction plays a very, very important role. That is where even the IOT, you know, like it's not, it may not possible for us to travel quite a lot uh, these days. For uh, earlier, we used to have a physical meeting for everything. And uh, maybe because of uh, materializing our decision fast, materialization of the decision was not taking place fast because of the physical meeting requirement uh, of the earlier days. Perhaps I think uh, pandemic has taught us, you know, like this, uh, that is not required for us to do it. Now say, for example, so many webinars, training programs we have been having. Similarly, even for the construction also, in the design engineering, in the, in the, in, in, in the updating the uh, data on a real time basis, all these things, the digital intervention can help. And uh, nowadays there are, uh, uh, you know that very well that the internet of things uh, people have been talking and the internet of things also can play a very, very important role uh, in my opinion, even the monitoring and the correcting, it can be easily done on, uh, on, on, on the net now, in, on, on the digital platform. It's not necessary for us to uh, really travel. And uh, certainly the pandemic has taught us and uh, whether we like it or not, the connected uh, construction is going to be the way, way of life. And even, even for that matter, I think the architect uh, is here. I think uh, most of this uh, construction is uh, especially when the architectures, architects are involved, it's a ne necessary and a mandatory requirement go for us to go for beam with this desk. Nobody works without a beam uh, what I, when it comes to this uh, building industry. Though in the infrastructure, it has to pick up uh, quite a lot. In the infrastructure industry, it has to pick up uh, quite a lot. Building, it is very, very... And once you get used to that, 
uh, you know, like this uh, uh, sort of a digital intervention. But I, I think uh, now already we, most of us are used to it. And even the productivity is quite fast. I will tell you that. Productivity is quite fast. Say, for example, uh, I will give you an example of our uh, Indian Road Congress. We have been bringing out a lot of codes and uh, uh, standards. Number of uh, frequency of the meetings has been increased and the productivity has increased. All this is because of this uh, the digital platform which we have been uh, using it. And uh, the, the physical presence of the labors by going for the automation, say, for example, using the digital, uh, digital technologies, I think the physical presence of the labors, the requirement of the labors at the site also may be reducing it. Uh, indirectly, that will also help, uh, uh, will be taken care of the health and safety issues, in my opinion. I think, uh, uh, I think this uh, question can be answered more by perhaps from the Harsh Parikh, who has been involved in, uh, in this. Uh, uh, in, in this, uh, in this uh, Harsh, I think you will be able to add on to that, uh, what I said. I think that will be uh, you, you are in a position to add on to this uh, in a better manner than me, I think. I think you've covered uh, uh, it so nicely. I think every aspect uh, the divide is uh, inevitable, yeah. is needed. Um, I think I would just add a bit uh, to it. Uh, I think we are all social um, animals, right? And I think in the professional environment also that social engineering is becoming more and more important nowadays, like how to uh, be connected. Uh, uh, decision making is the most important process, uh, right? And uh, with the help of uh, the digital engineering and digital tools, uh, nowadays uh, this is becoming a reality. Uh, and when you talk about uh, uh, connected uh, construction, I would call like reaching out the decisions to the last milestone. Yeah. And who is the last milestone? The person who is exec actually executing job at site. Right? And uh, I think nowadays we all have the power of uh, the best digital engineering. Right? So it's like <clears throat> how do we communicate uh, and that is the most important thing to me. And I think uh, Mr. Hegre mentioned one thing, uh, which is very true, the use of uh, real-time data. Because nowadays, uh, the only, uh, I would say, profitable thing today we see and we have is the data. And it is not only about data, it is real-time data. And how do you basically get acquainted with the real-time data? collecting the real-time data, collecting in real-time environment, right? And that is where the IoT comes into the picture. And like, that's where, and then we're all talking about how do we make decisions just by collecting the data, it doesn't help us. How does it help that we have uh, big words called machine learning? We have got uh, algorithmic uh, design. So today the computation power uh, and this uh, big data analysis allowing us to make uh, n number of simulations uh, of this real-time data analytics uh, to reach on a decision-making faster. So I think the connected means connecting blue collar with white collar, collecting, connecting different stakeholders. I think that was uh, beautifully explained in the presentation. Uh, right. And last but not the least, how do you communicate uh, your decision making intent to the last milestone? The person who doesn't even understand what the engineering drawings are, but still you are able to communicate that. I think that is the power of being connected. And uh, we talk engineering, design, construction in isolation. But um, I would say everybody who is a business owner sitting out here, uh, they're most worried about their profitability. How do you link your engineering and design with your business processes, right? That is what you call connectivity, that you don't connect just one aspect of your uh, engineering. The engineering revolves and then this uh, uh, sustainable design and uh, carbon emission uh, control, all of that comes into the picture. So thank you very much, sir, for asking this and beautifully explained uh, in your presentation. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Harshji. That was uh, very nice. And there's a lot of 
interesting words that you used in your answers about big data and the internet of things so i'm going to come back to that as well very very interesting and how how uh, this is integrated into connected construction uh, i had a question for dr bansal actually but i think we've just um, you know maybe he's lost connectivity there for a second uh -huh. so yeah so i will I'll, i'll maybe talk to him once he's back in the meantime uh, architect rohit uh, may i i mean i wanted to know your your get your inputs on um, how does connected construction help construct more sustainable structures and achieving operational carbon efficiency uh, first so for all i would like to thank dr agri for a wonderful presentation it was really enlightening to see the whole thing and when we talk about connection i think connectivity is true in all relationships without connectivity there is no relationships whether there is when you talk of home when you talk of people when you talk of friends family team whatever so connection is the first thing and we are here discussing uh, connected construction obviously uh, without that the game is over and looking at if you look at the the scenario the scenario today the uh, the achievements that we have to make by 2070 on what we were supposed to do by 2050 it's uh, it's not easy the targets are almost impossible but we are on the job we are going and doing it but to uh, what i feel uh, when i link connected uh, construction with what i am saying about the achievements we have to make is that to reach there governments are going to get so stringent laws are going to come up codings are going to happen so stringently and european union has already started it uk has started it very strongly uh once these things come in the most unorganized sector that we have the construction industry which is i think one of the most unorganized sector this will have to jolt out of and jump out of where it is standing yes and then it will have to stand tall and it will have to build <laughs> and build properly for that unless and until the the connectivity is there the connected construction is there it will not be able to stand on its own suddenly we will we've already started seeing it suddenly we will see a whole influx of tools and iots and systems coming into place and we are seeing it now only sensors are now so simple and easy cctvs are easily installed sensors are installed to check uh, temperatures to check soil conditions everything so i feel this 2070 agenda is one of the strongest reasons why the construction industry is going to jump out stand tall deliver and uh, be connected without that it's not possible all right thank you uh, dr bansal uh, we uh, we wanted to ask you a question earlier as well but somehow uh, you lost connectivity uh, connectivity but, <laughs> but great to have you back uh, dr bansal actually uh, i mean you are actually the man who is uh, on the ground and leading this initiative i mean cpwd is taking a lead in connected construction in india i mean you are one of the uh, for i mean the first few departments or bodies organizations in the country who is implementing erp across your organization um, right from requisitions to coordination to approvals completions procurement qc arbitration contract related uh, matters a lot of things i mean you are already implementing uh, through erp and connected construction for cbwd so i am very very uh, interested to know more about this and then also after uh, you uh, i mean about what is cbwd doing and how are you achieving this and what are the benefits you see and after that i also have some follow up questions uh, with you with respect to some data ca capturing layers so sir please if you could share with us uh, your experience in leading this initiative sir uh, you are on mute thank you saurabh and first of all uh, i congratulate dr mr hegde for the enlightening presentation and touching each and every aspect of construction from birth till its replacement and connected and um, that carbon uh, emission and issue that is discussed very nicely by the designers issue with the construction issue what i'm doing at is a very good correlation between two cpwd the premier construction industry has taken lot of initiatives 
as you rightly said, ERP. That is the administration part. Presently, what was, what was going on was so many things at different platforms. By means of ERP, we are bringing every aspect of our function, maybe administration, maybe at site, maybe of any type, maybe the arbitration, in everything in one platform at ERP, so that it becomes easier and there is no difference. Once we are talking from different platforms, there's definitely disparity. To avoid that, we are coming on a single platform and ERP has already started functioning. It was a mega project and it has been done in record times. And very soon, maybe in the six months old, we will be 100% on ERP, shifted to ERP. Now, I will emphasize on site because I'm a site engineer. What was happening in the past? We were appointing a designer. We were appointing a proof consultant. We were appointing architect. We were appointing the contractor. We were appointing the third party quality assurance. Then connecting all so many people, it was a uphill task. You ask monitoring one part, we're seeing the other is getting disturbed. Now, past I think three or four years, five years, CPWD has to one platform, single. Now, let me talk of my present project that aims Kashmir, which I'm making, in which uh, the contractor is there, consultant, architect, the architect, designer, proof designer. All three are under one umbrella, under the consultant. Earlier, I was taking headache for the three designs, designer, proof, consultant, architect. Now all three under one umbrella. The disparity between the architecture drawing and the structural drawing, it is resolved to a great extent. I'm The times I see that um, structural design, because they're not sitting in the same office. They're sitting in different offices. There's a time lag. The structural designer doing the design, submitting to a picture office. Then there are some errors coming to us. But still, it is much, much better than before. I have not to run to proof consultant. Whatever is doing, is doing, it is coming perfectly, if not perfectly, over, nearly okay. So three people are connected. Similarly, a construction site, uh, that uh, contractor, Contractor taking full charge of the site. In many of the construction, even design part is under the umbrella of the contractor. So we have connected that also. There's so many stakeholders. If we see all the stakeholders, it becomes difficult. So we have to reduce the number of stakeholders which CPWD is doing right. Last week, I was reading a book, uh, if you wrote Dr. Rashmi Bansal, Connecting the Dots. And when I was told by Mr. Prabir about this seminar, I was linking the two things together. In construction industries, there are so many doors, so many stakeholders, owner is there, consultant is there, designer is there, contractor is there, we are here, and there are other people who are affected. And for a sustainable construction, unless we connect all these dots together, being in one platform, it is not uh, going to give us much of it is, and uh, going to much advantage. We want economical construction, we want a fast construction, we want to be transparent everywhere, we want a quality construction, and all these are possible. And CPW is proceeding towards it with connecting all the dots together, and that way we are functional. Very, very, very interesting, Dr. Bansal. That was uh, great to know. I'm going to come back uh, on for one more follow-up question with respect to data capturing. How is CPWD capturing uh, this data on site? So uh, I'm going to go back to Mr. Harsh Parekh now. Uh, you mentioned uh, with respect to how, I mean, some of the benefits in terms of ma uh, marking delays, improving efficiencies on site. So could you, I, I'm very interested to know about certain, a few case studies uh, with this, in which you can talk to us about where connected construction uh, was used or software uh, for connected construction. If you can please take us to that. I think uh, uh, as far as Tremble is concerned, uh, we are part and parcel of uh, every uh, complex project today which is getting delivered. Uh, there are many, but few basically, which comes to my mind straight away. Uh, I think one is uh, Dr. Bansal, where he's sitting, it's like uh, the Chenab uh, Bridge is a great uh, monument uh, just coming up uh, like highest, uh, the highest uh, altitude, uh, <clears throat> right? Uh, and it is, a, it is a sheer example of uh, uh, connected uh, technology driven execution, uh, right? Right from a, a conceptual design phase to a detailed design phase and then uh, into the construction phase, like execution phase. Uh, 
it it became possible only because uh, they they did the complete digital simulation before it it actually came into the existence uh, in the construction phase that was number one uh, the second thing was about uh, what is the use of these uh, digital uh, models uh, they are not a lot of time uh, people say that uh, maybe they are a great uh, thing to visualize and uh, visualize the project before it comes real but I think the real essence of these digital model is like running a simulated uh, running uh, your actual situation in simulated environment so uh, sequencing is very very important with such with such complex and large project uh, it is not about structural analysis and design simulation only, but actually the construction sequencing and simulation is very, very important that uh, um, what uh, phase uh, needs to come one after the another and whether this is the right way of execution or not. So um, and we, while we all talked about the carbon emission, uh, like how do we control that? So I think simulating these kind of scenarios in a virtual environment before we actually go onto the site can really help us reducing uh, a lot of hassles in these uh, carbon footprints uh, to be under control. Uh, so to me that the, the another important uh, aspect of this is like time and cost overrun is the biggest uh, challenge. I think every uh, webinar, every seminar we speak about, like at least for past 20 years, we are all talking about the same challenge, time and cost overrun. And, and uh, um, I think uh, the architect uh, Angia very clearly said that this is the most unorganized sector. How long we can continue to be the most unorganized? And that is where this uh, digital revolution is trying to bring, that we are moving more and more towards manufacturing-centered uh, construction, right? In manufacturing, in auto industry, like it is adopted like 40 years ago, where we have the assembly lines uh, to manufacture uh, the cars or bikes or anything. Similarly, in construction also, this process-centered construction is more important, where the simulation in the virtual environment is needed. So uh, this is only the design side and the detailed engineering side we are talking about. And uh, you will recall what I said. It is much easier to communicate uh, to the person who is executing when he sees that, hey, this is how things need to be executed. and. Uh, as uh, Dr. Bunsel said, once everything is there, and then you link it uh, with your ERP systems, right? You are actually linking your construction or engineering with your business process uh, to avoid any kind of a duplication, redundancies, and like uh, the uh, in, in construction, I think the biggest thing is what we call RFIs. The moment we are able to bring down our RFIs, I think automatically our project is going to be pretty much under the control uh, of a given timeline and cost. So that's where the biggest benefit I find of uh, this digital engineering and connectivity creates a major role. Wow, it's very, very uh, important. Uh, with that, I have, uh, I'm again going to come back to you, Harsh Parikji, on the te uh, technology aspect in some time. Uh, in the meantime, architect Rohit Nagia, uh, I, I, I mean, as we all know, RERA, brought in a lot of transparency uh, into the real estate segment for the consumer or the end user, the public. Uh, architect uh, Nagya, the question for you is, I, I request your inputs on how can connected construction improve transparency for the consumer or the end user, whatever, maybe a building or infrastructure. Uh, I mean, you once had, in fact, uh, discussed with me also this aspect of how uh, the consumers can benefit from this. So, if you can please share some light on that. So, this you you just reminded me of uh, what happened around eight years ago in our office. So, uh, like usual architects' offices, what happens is nobody knows what is to be done. Every morning, people come in and we say, "Ki tum aajye drawing banao, tum aajye drawing banao. You make this, you make this, you make this." And then you get a call, and then you say, "Okay, stop this, do this." first let's push this aside so around 8 years ago we uh, in our office we were this was this was happening but uh, was something else which was very uh, painful was we used to get these calls from clients from sites when is the next drawing coming 
you know so that is that is like a very key uh, a, key, a key question that comes in every time and we used to get very hassled because we said we used to always feel ki yeah, we we give drawings on time what is the problem we'll send it to you when it's required but then that was not uh, uh, that was not the uh, that, was, that the answer was not enough and the constant questions the constant questions and we were very particular about this fact that this is one thing that most architects offices fail in and we have to be particularly careful that our drawings are always on time so we brainstormed and we brainstormed and we created a system we created a very normal system on uh, on a google sheet where we listed down all the steps involved through our uh, through our office all the tasks all the drawings involved that will have to be sent for a project and we made something like 3790 steps and those steps had the the name of the person who's supposed to do that the the date at which the drawing will go so we created this master sheet and whenever a new project would come we would uh, put the name of that project on that on a on a copy of that sheet make that sheet it it used to take i think around 4 5 days to make the entire flow chart of uh, the the entire project and we made it a little automated we had some interesting people in office who could automate that that if you change some dates the further dates would again scroll down uh, in fact i think it will be interesting can i share my screen for a minute let me show you this i i have it with me because we keep using it is this visible yeah. yes it's visible okay so this is something like we call it a flow chart monitoring sheet this starting from the first uh, recorded client call stage who will do it when it will be done so this is like the master copy so it's showing august 2017 and then the whole flow of site survey client meeting then there is a discussion about the client's requirements and then there's a thank you note to be sent and then a contract goes and stuff and then the the uh, the process of checking the green ratings how we are whether we are doing it properly or not we have to research and document it and then we had these names of the project head will take care of this it will be done by checklist number so and so this is the date of when it will be done so this went on and on and on this started for the architectural part and then if it's an interior project it started off on that and this was like a like i told you a 4000 so uh, 4000 steps process so like even before beginning of a uh, project the the final sanitary ware fittings are finalized quotations from vendors are got the the idea was to create this kind of a list and then to uh, whenever somebody used to say ki when are, when is when is the next set of drawings coming we used to be very happy and we used to take a screenshot of this and send it across for the next 15 30 days saying that these are the dates this is the person responsible don't bother it will come and uh, i think this is why i'm telling you all this is this is the the beginning of connectivity that we had the experience the first experience of connectivity which we had and suddenly the whole team got connected suddenly we realized we could send this to the client also and the client was very happy that he knew when what is coming so i think it saved time for us to stop answering those kind of questions because the questions stopped and hidden uh, hidden benefits started coming up one of them was on time delivery of course the next thing was that team started bonding there was no more this is to be done by you this is to be done by me the team started bonding as they knew exactly what was supposed to be done and when then there was easy coordination between consultants because we started sending this sheet to our consultants so our structural engineers knew when the drawings are going to come in and when they are expected back and the best thing that happened was that we eradicated human error absolutely it 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 went out so for example let's say there is an rf uh, a gfc gone and some detail is supposed to be sent with that usually what happens is that if it's in your memory you will make it and get it sent if it's not it goes away so with this small things as small things like even if we have to uh, the route of pipelines through a beam to the shaft outside to the building is done in our design development stage even before the basement construction starts so we know exactly where the holes are going to be uh, so all this when i saw this big thing it, it was like a big explosion where we saw this is wonderful we said this is uh, this is just amazing that you can plan everything in advance you can take care of errors you don't have any errors at all everybody is uh, comfortable 
and um, it's it's all going sequentially like harshji just said so i am giving you a a small window of what connected construction did to our office and how it has helped us manage projects so fast and this was almost like an erp which we created on our own but it's it's going well still now and everything is going smoothly and yeah uh, i am not saying it it uh, works every day and uh, the drawings are going on time perfectly on that dot it goes away by another 2 3 days that, that's fine at least it's going before the it's required at site and the questions have stopped and because of this planning there is no core cutting later on there is no holes to be created later on there is no missed sums in the basement it's all there because it's all organized it's systemized and the drawing will be picked up by the relevant person finished and sent to site so if it can do so much wonders for once my office i mean i can't imagine the growth connected construction can do if if all the uh, stakeholders are there if it can be applied to the bidding process to the health of workers to managing their movement and more than that i think uh, like the professor hegre also said 28% of uh, carbonization ha happens during the construction of the raw material construction stage just takes up around 2% and around 69% or 70% is in the lifetime of the building so if this if connected construction can be a part of all these sensors and everything uh, during the construction of process it is already measuring the raw material uh, carbon content it is calculating the life time value of stuff it is uh, it through machine learning it is giving concepts and technologies to the user through the next 40 50 years as to how the building will perform how it will be uh, what areas will require maintenance and how they could improvise it so like each design is different each each design each project is different but learning from one project can be applied to another project and i think over time as uh, as the connected construction software evolves it is going to help us reach our goal much more faster and uh, much more easier yeah very well connect uh, very well conveyed uh, architect nagya there are a lot of follow up questions which i'm going to uh, first i'm going to go to engineer hegde and then i'm going to ask uh, dr bansal uh, dr bansal uh, i'm keen to know more about the life cycle and durability part Uh, for CPWD project, so I'm going to uh, discuss that with you shortly. But before that, uh, engineer uh, V N Hegde, uh, you, I mean, very well covered uh, the carbon aspect of all of it, as architect Nagya also mentioned. So the entire world is now moving towards uh, carbon neutrality, carbon neutral cities, low carbon cities. There are so many examples in Europe, and of course, a very good example. close by is masdar city in abu dhabi just about two and a half uh, hours from india uh, so i mean that is where the future is for sure uh, you also talked about ccus very very interesting ccus mm -hmm. so uh, can i have your thoughts on carbon sequestration in concrete there is new new concretes and new technologies i mean new concretes are being developed with respect to carbon sequestration and what are the benefits the advantages of that for us uh you see the as far as uh, i know that uh, new concrete especially uh, in uh, japan lot of work has been done the concrete without the cement i think uh, of course there's a lot of lobby uh, you know uh, working against that in fact i have heard a presentation from fib president uh, mr atio dr atio kasuga and uh, his company that samsung mitsubishi is doing a lot of research on the concrete which doesn't require a cement you know that uh, has been uh, uh, going on that is one of the areas but uh, as far as the sequestration is concerned see what happens is during the process as uh, architect uh, rohit explained the carbon uh, uh, carbon uh, carbon emission due to the construction process is not uh, is not uh, compared to that of the product stage product stage when i say uh, the material of cement as well as the steel and even the aggregate for that matter also that contributes uh, to a certain extent carbon emission because of the construction itself construction process itself is not uh, much which it's because of the material production so the carbon emission which is taking place because of the construction process 
uh, is what like you know like burning the fuels like you know if you are burning the diesel or if you are burning uh, those sort of energy if that energy can be you know like uh, substituted with the renewable sources energy somehow say for example uh, where the construction site is going on if you can you know have a solar energy or some energy plant which which you can produce it's a, i think we are very far from that uh, so it's not very easy that can be done but sequestration in my opinion it is only where you know product uh, you know that the carbon capture has to take place you know carbon emission plants like steel plants uh, thermal plants uh, and also for that matter the uh, the 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 cement plants they emit lot of carbon that has to be captured and that has to be converted into some chemicals and it can be used for some other due to the construction process itself i i i doubt except for there are some concretes which has been produ produced without without using the cement similarly i think uh, there are uh, uh, you know like uh, there are uh, research lot of thing is going on about this frb bars you know frb where uh, perhaps you know the steel is not used only the polymer uh, you know like that that bar is used that also i think uh, is going on but uh, that, I, that's a long way to go i, I pers personally feel but uh, uh, that sequestration is basically for the carbon which has been captured during the production of uh, uh, materials i don't think uh, construction process it, you know uh, it, it doesn't uh, emit so much carbon dioxide to the environment uh, uh, compared to that of the product uh, manufacturing product production you know this what i feel Thank I you. I think this question, if anybody else can take, uh, uh, I'll be happy on this. Or you yourself can answer that. Uh, 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 I'll be happy. In fact, Bill Gates is funding a project which is uh, trying to do something called a DAC, direct air capture of yeah. carbon dioxide. That's right. Yes. Yeah. So that is an interesting phenomenon. And what you mentioned about green green cement, which is coming up, it's around 95% fly ash and 5% of renewable uh, uh, liquids. Yeah. Which is highly effective, a little expensive as of now, but yes, there is development happening. But the yes. lobby will have to be taken care of. Yeah. No, that was, uh, I mean, a very uh, optimal answer, Engineer uh, Hegde. But yes, uh, I am aware that there is a lot of research going on on concretes, uh, which I mean, once they cure and once they harden, uh, yes, they sort yes. of enable the sequestration of carbon dioxide yeah. in the overall environment. So I mean, maybe we can have a session. Uh, later on that as well. Uh, now, uh, I'm very interested to talk to Dr. Bansal because Dr. Bansal is a man on the ground as well. Uh, I mean, actually implementing uh, connected construction. So uh, for, for so many years, we have been talking about durability and we have been talking about life cycle and service life of a structure. There are so many models that have come up, uh, Life 365 that are in the US and then there's so many European models, Japanese models that say that they're prescriptive models that if you, I mean, go about these concretes, this kind of steel, this kind of admixtures, uh, this is the kind of life that you can expect in this kind of temperature, this kind of a region, this kind of chloride, this kind of sulfate. So, I mean, it's more of, again, modeling. However, what um, CPWD is now doing uh, with this connected construction way or with your various uh, software and technology way is that your uh, they are develop I mean, having various data capturing layers like IOT sensors, SCADA integration, where in their structures, they're going to have continuous data that is going to be fed to them throughout the life of the structure. And that is very, very interesting that an organization, uh, I mean, that CPWD is uh, leading this. Uh, I mean, it's not yet live as uh, Dr. Bansal said, but it's going to be very soon as part of the uh, ERP measure uh, that they're taking. Uh, so, Dr. Bansal, I would like to uh, request your inputs, number one, on I mean, how will connected construction uh, that you are implementing help with durability and life cycle of a structure as well? Sort of. Uh, in CPWD, we do have our own design wing, central design organization. But at present, there's so many mega projects, so many IITs, IAMs, AIMs, projects are going on that uh, we cannot take up the design load in our central office. As for the design wing of our own design wing, central design organization concerned, I can tell you that our standards are more stringent than what BIS is prescribing. I tell you my own experience when I started my career and I was a designer in initial stages, I designed a slab and 80 mm slab as per code, it was okay. 
and uh, three times the thickness of 8M dia at 240M centrifuge. Went with the drawing to my boss, and he told rejected it. Can they see CPWD will never give a slab less than 100M? Where BIS codes used to say 80M, I'm talking of 90s, early 90s. Spacing BIS code allows 250MM, but we are not going beyond 200 mm If you see the result impact of this, both earthquake, so many buildings fell down, but CPWD construction all remained alive. Not a single building fell down that all building is said both earthquake. But nowadays we are more dependent on our consultant, but yes, our directions are there. We have to follow the latest codes, latest one, durable building, life design, service life design. They are taking care of all these things. As in, in fact, in our site also, we are not using ordinary steel. We are using this corrosion resistant steel. That's definitely going to increase the life of the structures. Then now to save the time also, we are shifting to the pre-engineered buildings. Like in Ames, the whole hospital building that we are making pre-engineered building and that will increase us life is better and even the time of construction that will reduce drastically. So we are taking of all these things, durability aspect, service life design or life cycle of the project. We are taking care of all these things. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And you're not only taking care, you're leading the way and you're uh, I mean, making standards and showing the country how it is done. So thank you. Uh, I would like to uh, next uh, question is for, as I had mentioned for Mr. Parikh, uh, you mentioned uh, Mr. Parikh that there's um, already a lot of integration of, of uh, big data uh, into your uh, connected construction software. So could you please uh, share with us a little bit about, I mean, uh, integration of big data, maybe Hadoop or such kind of uh, technologies in uh, the software and how will that benefit the construction industry? Because finally, this is all, all this data that's going to get captured. It's going to be stored on the cloud. It needs to be processed. Uh, so can you please share some light, shed some light on that? That's a very interesting uh, thing. And I would like to share like two examples, like very simple and probably uh, very useful as well. Uh, we are uh, doing so many projects, so many projects, I think, and we have uh, uh, like uh, quite a bit of data already available. We're doing hospital projects, uh, uh, school projects and industrial projects. Now, uh, one question to the largest uh, EPC um, contracting company uh, in country, anyone we can talk. We want to bid another project, right? And we again start working from zero, right? We have that of experience uh, already available. We have so much of a data available, but for every project, we are starting from zero again. And we are building and maybe we are doing that conceptual design and we are basically, we can say, this is uh, a proposal, bid proposal. If we already have so much of a data available, why can't we make use of it? Nowadays, the technology is available where you can actually uh, uh, combine all the experience of the projects being already delivered. You basically bring it in a centralized digital uh, environment. And then you have uh, the artificial intelligence and machine learning modules available, which basically predicts the performance that a, if this is the type of a project, this is the duration you took, this is the cost of the project, then predictability is, and that is what we are talking about the uh, data sciences and data analytics today, where we not only talk about the descriptive analysis, but we talk about descriptive analysis, we have the data available, we talk about predictive and the prescriptive analysis. So these kind of things are already available. Maybe uh, like we are still working uh, quite a bit in terms of Excel sheets and other stuff. I think that is a way of, uh, one way of digital, like a lot of time and uh, like, don't get me wrong, but a lot of times uh, with, with variety of government organization, I say, what is the level of digitization you guys have done? And say like, we all have our documents in uh, digital format. I think that's, uh, that's not the right way. I think we have surpassed that way uh, where the real time data if we can churn that data and come out with some decision making process uh, is, is what I call and that's already happening. Now, let's take a, a simple example. We want to design a chair. 
we want to design a chair, how many alternatives we can work out today? Um, uh, I think we can really work out n number of uh, alternatives. And especially when we are talking about this 3D printing, we, we don't really need to, maybe the design can happen some part in uh, the Western world, but today if you go to Mumbai uh, and the Dharavi region, and maybe I can install uh, my 3D printer over there, maybe from there I can share the design and tomorrow I can make the delivery out of that chair and whether uh, it's a carbon fiber chair or what kind of a chair, it is available. That is the power of uh, the connectivity, like uh, the globe is becoming uh, very small and the connectivity uh, provides us the more and more avenues for business. Uh, let us go into the construction per se. <clears throat> we go on site, there is a road site going on uh, and I as an, let us say, I own an organization and I have 20 sites running. How do I predict the performance of my labor equipment and material? At which site when is the material needed, which equipment is required, at which side, how many uh, uh, resources are at particular site, how do you do all sorts of analysis, right? Right now we all manage this in some kind of Excel sheet and so-called uh, project management software, but I think the project management software which are available today takes care of only two things. What is that? Yes, the location, um, I think time and activity. They don't take care of the location, uh, we have things available that we are taking care of the time, location, and activity, right? Because these three are dependent uh, parameters on each other. And this is where, if I can, I think Sir talked about uh, IoT, uh, Internet of Things, and we can capture the information. Imagine on every dozer, paver, excavator, if I can install my IoT device, right, I can capture the data that how much amount of earthwork I have done today, right? Nobody can manipulate. It will be completely transparent, right? And I have one uh, dashboard, an analytics dashboard at my headquarters, uh, the, all the machine data, machine performance data, I am basically uh, feeding into that analytics board. And every day I know what is the performance in terms of labor, in terms of my equipment and how much material I have dumped or I have extracted. This is what we call data analytics in the real time uh, form, which is already taking place. You go to Delhi International Airport, right? That's how uh, the things are happening. So predicting the performance uh, is more needed and that basically uh, uh, allows us to be more profitable and uh, predictive uh, in terms of delivery of our projects. Very uh, uh, interesting. One, uh, Parikji, thank you. Uh, Parikji, so, uh, I mean, as I mean, connecting, I mean, talking about Dr. Bansal's points as well as about what you shared with us. So uh, purely from a con construction industry point of view, so about say, more, sin, I don't know, 90%, you cannot say, give it a percentage value, but let's say most, most problems uh, in concrete uh, can be overcome by taking measures when the concrete is still green, in the green state or still in the wet state. And that is exactly something that you just talked about, that IoT sensors, uh, or I mean, and Dr. Bansal is already implementing that at CPWD projects with uh, concrete plants, uh, IoT sensors at, I mean, ready mix plants, concrete plants for slump, temperature, retention, compressive strength, uh, so many things that can be done at, at the green stage. So, I mean, very interesting that what Mr. Bansal is doing, uh, Mr. Parikh also is talking about the same thing as, as integrating and predicting the behavior of concrete while concrete is still in the green state. So very, very interesting and will be very useful uh, for the industry. Uh, something else that uh, I wanted to also, uh, I mean, appreciate about, uh, I mean, Mr. Parikh is that uh, it's very important what you're doing this initiative today uh, in terms of consumer awareness. You are making the consumer, the end consumer also aware that this kind of technology does exist where the, where the consumer can have these transparent dashboards and exactly know the progress. I mean, not only the owners, not only the uh, structural engineers, but also the consumer uh, can know what the, the status of his project exactly is today once he's invested money, the investor in that particular project. So, uh, 
and how important this is. So, I mean, maybe about 40 years ago, Intel did this for the IT or the computer industry where they had this Intel inside campaign where they made the consumer aware of what a chip is. Otherwise, we just knew about, uh, say, Dell computers or about Apple. We didn't know actually what the component was and what actually takes to have I mean, this kind of performance. So that's exactly what you're doing um, for the construction industry as well. So I think, uh, I mean, great that the awareness that you're, you're doing and more such awareness is required for the end consumer uh, level as well. So that we all uh, get to know about I, I want to I want to add a bit here. I think once you said about the awareness, and sorry, I'm taking a couple of your minutes uh, uh, from this. Um, uh, which is the most uh, prominent structure we talk today? I think for every structural engineer, and I think we as an Indian should also be proud of it. it's like Statue of Unity. It's like the tallest uh, structure, and it's a monument in itself. Like it's an engineering marvel. Uh, uh, when we talk about like we all engineers, we have delivered like uh, fantastic uh, structures. But when you talk about uh, the, it is the tallest tower, right? And you talk about the measure of uh, verticality that how it needs to be actually vertical. And sometimes uh, you should uh, explore the virtual model which uh, got developed. And this virtual model was uh, virtually similar in, in, in maintaining uh, the verticality of this and how many devices basically were installed there. And uh, while the construction was happening, the vertical check. So this is all, this all was captured during uh, the construction and uh, like uh, contractors and engineers did a great job in maintaining that. And today it's in a, it's in a fascinating state. And we at Trimble are proud to be part of that uh, uh, structure as a technology provider. So thank you so much for uh, asking that. Uh, yes, and uh, yeah, no, thank you. It's very interesting. And I mean, that's all what we all, all of us have been waiting for uh, being able to predict the life cycle of a structure right and predict and monitor that's i mean the most critical aspect today uh hold the life cycle cost of a project not just a cost today uh uh, hey, uh i have a question for you uh next since you are uh, in fact uh, a thought leader not just in india but also across the world so the uh, engineer vn hegre is working on the special uh, task group that is uh, framing the fib model code 2020 yeah. and yes. uh, recently also the american concrete institute in the us has i mean their original standard on concrete was something known as aci 318 which talks about structural concrete and now they've come up with an online portal known as aci 318 plus where mm -hmm. once you log into that portal it integrates all the documents and the codes of aci in that portal so whatever you want is again connected connected yeah. documentation something like that, I mean, which will aid connected construction. Uh, so engineer Hegre, my question to you is that, uh, I mean, what do you think uh, about the future possibility of maybe even uh, the FIB model code, the ACI codes being integrated into these kind of softwares where in the software itself, you can sort of uh, refer to it and then attach it, the particular code reference to the drawing. Uh, so I would like to request your inputs on this aspect. Yeah, I think uh, uh, so far, you know, like that, the, no attempts have been made to, you know, like uh, to 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 integrate this uh, codal codes to this uh, software, except for you know, uh, whoever has been paying that uh, the copies made available uh, on net. Otherwise, uh, integrating the codal uh, provisions itself into the software and uh, uh, making use of that uh, in the designs, uh, say for example, I think that is not uh, happening. Uh, but uh, uh, I think that is the way forward. Perhaps I think you can explain on the ACI side. I don't know about the ACI side, but as far as the FIB is concerned, the integration of the codal provisions into, uh, into, into sort of, you know, uh, directly linking it to the design processes and all is not, uh, it's, it's not, uh, we, we, uh, the FIB is not working in that direction at least. Okay, no, yeah, no. Yeah. Okay, so uh, that's something that Mr. Harish Pari can discuss with you. Maybe like, that can be interesting for him to talk to you on that in the future. Okay, and uh, I think more or less uh, I am done with my uh, my discussion points. I mean, the the forum is open. We can take some questions also. Uh, but before that, just a final uh, question for uh, Dr. Bansal. Uh, I just, uh, I mean, you're you're working on a very challenging project in a challenging terrain. 
uh, in JNK. So uh, if you can please share with us some of the uh, issues that you face, some of the problems that you face and how was the, how were they tackled? Uh, I mean, was it through connected construction or any other way? I mean, it's very, very interesting, the kind of terrain, terrain you're working in. Saurabh, you raised a very, very valid question. And in fact, we faced a very big challenge. See, when we talk of connected construction, we started talking of all the stakeholders. And we know who are our stakeholders. Client is there, owner is there, designer is there, contractor is there, and so the special agencies, vendors, suppliers, so many people. But in this project, unique thing happened. Another stakeholder who was nowhere in the list, he suddenly came up and came up with his problem and got our all the work stopped at site. That was defense people. Our site is statistically just abutting defense uh, establishment. And there was a guidelines for defense establishment that you cannot construct a building more than four story within half kilometer of their uh, boundary wall. And incidentally, our hospital, 11 story hospital was at 200 meter distance. And when we had com nearly completed a foundation, they came up with their guidelines. And I raised up the issue. Finally, there's a big committee formed under the um, Secretary of Health and Secretary of Defense. Everybody came to picture. After three months of discussions, finally, we had to change the master plan. And what we started, we have started very efficient construction. Within six months, we are nearly completed the foundation of the hospital and so many other important buildings. And we didn't know that there's another stakeholder army is there. And because of the location, it is in District Pulwama. And because of strategic location, nobody uh, able to counter them. Though there was the guidelines only. And somehow we changed the master plan and 11 months we lost. We are again back to square one. Only October it passed, then the winters. Now we are restarting the work. And see, that's what I'm saying. When you are connecting, you should know exactly who are your stakeholders. And then we get them very well connected. And now, Another thing is, what we did is, initially their time period of three and a half years. Now we lost nearly one year, left for two and a half years. And I have taken challenge, now I complete the work in two and a half years. So the more buildings are there, we converted in between design from uh, ordinary RCC construction to pre-engineered building, like academic block. Now we are making four story. So contractor requested, we agree. Just we want to finish it fast within remaining two and a half years. So we are doing all kind of Step this so that time is not lost. And if we are able to save time, we are saving cost also. We are saving, uh, we are doing better service society at an early date. So to make it a truly sustainable construction, we are taking all the actions. Great, great, wonderful. Thank you for sharing that with us. So, I mean, it's uh, been a very eye opening uh, session today. I mean, if this is the kind of professionals that we have uh, in India and Indian construction industry, I mean, the industry is bound to grow and sort of uh, be a, I mean, leader across the world. As uh, Engineer Hegre also pointed that India is already trying to be uh, a leader in terms of carbon neutrality or low, low carbon footprint. So thank you very much, everyone, for your input. It was wonderful interacting with all of you, Engineer Hegre, Dr. Bansal, Mr. Harsh Parikh, architect Rohit Nagya. Thank you very much. And with that, uh, I hand it over uh, to the organizers. We're at... Uh, Time, Thank you, Engineer Saurabh. I would now like to present the vote of thanks. It's such an honor for me to get the opportunity to thank all the dignitaries. We would like to express our gratitude to our esteemed speaker, panelists, and moderator for taking out the time from the busy schedule to grace the event and making this webinar a great success. We would also like to extend our thanks to our sponsors, Trimble Solutions India, and all the participants for their active participation in this event. Once again, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.